Some recent research from Aviva had put the age at which people aspire to retire at at age 60, which is quite interesting. And I thought in this video, we'll just look at the assets that someone might have and where they would potentially look to draw an income from. Because clearly retiring at age 60, you've got that gap from 60 to when your state pension kicks in that effectively needs to be filled. So we're gonna have a think about the assets that you might have and where you might look to draw an income from. Previously, when we've looked at this, we've typically looked at utilizing the general investment account first. So that's the taxable uh, pots you might have. And obviously you do to look to use those first because of they're the least tax efficient often. Then you typically look at the ISA money, the, the ISAs that you might have in place. And then lastly, we'd look at utilizing the pension, the pension being the last port of call to use. The primary reason for typically leaving the pension last is because of that very valuable tax benefit as far as inheritance tax is concerned, that ability to pass that on to your nominated beneficiaries, potentially free of tax. So the rule here as a reminder is that pre or post age 75, so pre age 75, if you've got the uh, pension set up in a nice modern account uh, that can facilitate beneficiaries drawdown, then that pot of money can go to your nominated beneficiaries completely free of tax, either as a tax-free lump sum or as a tax-free income. So the money can actually remain in the pension, go to your nominated beneficiaries, it's called beneficiaries drawdown, and they can actually potentially draw an income from it. After age 75, it's then treated very much in the same way, apart from it gets taxed at their marginal rate of income tax. So again, if you were to die after age 75, that, that pension part could get passed on to them, and either they can have it as a, a lump sum, which potentially they wouldn't want to do, depending on the size of the pot that, that's there, uh, because they all get taxed on it accordingly, according to their tax position, or they can leave it in the pension again and take a beneficiary's drawdown and therefore they get, they get, they get taxed on it. Or they don't have to take anything from, from it at all and they can leave it where it is and potentially pass it on to the next generation thereafter. But the point being ultimately is that that pension is sheltered outside of uh, inheritance tax, so potentially a 40% saving there. So that's really why you might typically look not to utilize or look to utilize the pension as the last port of call as far as, as assets are concerned, because ISAs would be included in someone's estate along with general investment accounts or uh, taxable accounts such as that. Potentially where this could be different is if an individual doesn't have a beneficiary that they wish to pass the money on, or even maybe they want to enjoy and spend the money themselves. It's their money they built up over many years and they don't wish to look to pass any of it on at all. And so therefore they're going to look to spend it. So that could change the dynamics in terms of how you spend and how you use that income. And we'll have a look using an example using Mr. Pickles and he's got a couple of different accounts and we'll just have a look at the tax treatment of those accounts and how they could be layered up and how he could take them in conjunction with the state pension as well. So as before, here's Mr. Pickles. We'll just look at the assumptions first so you know where the starting point of this is coming from. Now this isn't really about the amounts uh, in terms of the total values of his pots or anything like that. It's more to do with just looking at the where the income is coming from and the tax treatment of that income and, and potentially why he's looking to do it as he is. So you can see he's got 2.5% inflation rate. We're running this to age 100 and he's looking to retire at age 60. In terms of saving pots, we've got 200,000 in a personal pension, so it's a decent sized personal pension, and he's, uh, he's built up 100,000 in an ISA. Now just on ISAs, very, very briefly, um, something to be mindful of, and, uh, and it's something that Mike raised in the comments, was that you do have to think carefully when you are using ISAs as far as a good example would be Hargreaves Lansdowne. If you're using their stocks and shares ISA versus their general investment account, if you're just allocating to, let's say, shares, ETFs, or investment trusts, then potentially you can be better off if you're not gonna be holding the ISA for a long period of time, or you are looking at relatively small amounts. And I'm gonna run the numbers on this and maybe it's for another video. Certainly with general investment accounts, there very often isn't a charge on those accounts. And it could be a zero charge, as in the case with Hargreaves Lansdowne. If you were to use their stocks and shares ISA to hold your ETFs or shares, then there will be a 0.45 charge. I think it goes up to 45 pounds uh, maximum fee. But just to bear that in mind for smaller accounts, sometimes it doesn't make sense uh, in some cases to actually use an ISA 
because of those additional costs. But as I say, I'll run the numbers. It'll be an interesting one to have a look at, but certainly with larger size stocks and shares, ISAs, and over very long periods of time, then it's highly likely that um, you would potentially exceed the capital gains tax allowances or the income tax allowances as far as dividend allowances concerned with those larger pots. We've got this growing at 6% a year for each account. So we got exactly, let's say we've got identical investments in both accounts. In the personal pension it's growing at 6% and the ICE is growing at 6%, which gives us a real rate of return of 3.5% because we're running a 2.5% inflation rate, which is obviously a little bit uh, lower than uh, the inflation rate we currently have at the moment. As far as his living expenses are concerned, he's looking to take £20,000 a year. Uh, this is in line with the PLSA's retirement living standards for a moderate standard of living. And again, he's taking that from age 60. And then I'll just explain this because it looks a bit blocky and a bit crazy in terms of the blocks that are going here. But I am trying to keep this as super simple as possible. So we literally just got the ISA and we've got the pension. And then we're just going to look at the him taking those benefits from there. Now, in this situation, we're, we've retained the tax-free cash. So we haven't taken the tax-free cash out. So I know in some cases, some people would look to take the tax-free cash out if they have some residual mortgage. Sometimes that tax-free cash could be used to, to pay the mortgage. There's pros and cons to that. that very very much comes down to each individual as far as making that kind of decision on whether they should pay down the mortgage or not. So we start with the very straightforward position here in that what's happening is that age 60, the salary, the income stops, but we know that we're not going to get our state pension until age 67. So in effect, we've just got this gap, this period of time that we're looking to fill with some income. Now, what makes sense here is that when we're looking at the drawdown account that we're thinking about, we've got £12,570 of personal allowance. Now, if we were just to take our ISA money first and just draw on that ISA money, effectively we're sacrificing that personal allowance that is available for you for those seven years, that period of time, which is an incredibly valuable benefit. So the risk here is that we don't use our personal allowance now and we end up having to pay more tax later because then we're taking from taxable pots at a later, later stage in our life. So we're keeping this nice and straightforward. We'll take £12,570 of taxable drawdown, of taxable pension money. So effectively utilizing all of our personal allowance, we can then top that up with our tax-free cash because we're going to be taking 25% tax-free cash. So either we're doing this as enough plus each year, or we're just simply doing this as a phase drawdown. So every time we crystallize a portion of the pension, 25% of that is tax-free cash and 75% is taxable income, which gives us a total income of 16,750, but obviously he's looking for 20,000, so we can top that up with 3,240 pounds of ISA money. Then our state pension kicks in at age 67, so we've got 9,339 of taxable income, which is going to eat up that personal allowance. But then what we can add to this is we can then top that up with 3,231 of taxable income to use up, use up our 12,570 of personal allowance. And again, a little bit of tax-free cash on top of that of 1,077. So we haven't used all of our tax-free cash up front. So we have that ability to string out or use our tax-free cash out over the years as way of bolstering our income without being taxed on it. In addition, we then add another 6,353, which is an ISA withdrawal. So again, completely free of tax, we can draw that money out of the ISA to bring him up to that 20,000 pounds. The interesting thing is if we don't have to do this in this order, uh, because we've hit the pension early on because we wanted to use that personal allowance up, it does mean that we end up leaving uh, a quite a large amount of ISA money left over, which is where the income is then derived from in those later years. Obviously, all that ISA money is completely free of tax, but potentially you could do this either way. So, you know, in those earlier years from age 67, you could be using the ISA money with the intention of using the pension money later on. Again, typically the pension money being left last for inheritance tax purposes, it makes a lot of sense under that, under that situation. And of course that could change or evolve over time. So that's something just to bear in mind when you're looking at or thinking about where you derive your incomes from. And that's what I'm really just wanting you to think about is when you're looking at those assets, just thinking about what allowances or what areas or where you would actually draw that income from to do it in the most tax efficient way as possible. So this situation is fantastic for Mr. Pickles. Let's say he was a 20% 
taxpayer uh, when he was making contributions in. He was getting his 20% tax relief on those pension contributions. And now he's able to draw that money out completely free of tax over his retirement. This is as good a position as you can be in. Even better if you're obviously a 40% taxpayer and you're getting 40% tax relief. And then again, you're able to draw potentially that income out without paying any tax on it at all, which is as nice a position as you can get. Obviously this gets trickier if you have defined benefit pensions um, in addition to your state pension because there isn't really a high degree of flexibility with defined benefit pension pots where you are pretty much have a fixed level of income that is taken. And then we can see the impact on the assets over time as we are gradually drawing down on the money and the heavy impact on the personal pension because we hit it fairly hard early on and we take quite a high contribution, high, high percentage out from that, which gives a bit of a chance for the ISA to recover. And then we only start drawing really heavily down once the pension money is run out on the ISA in those later years. And obviously it does last them until uh, they're much older. And then what I always like to do is just show you the variable version of this rather than looking at just the linear model. And this obviously shows the variability of those returns over time. And this is looking at 1990, I think to 2011. And so a fairly strong period of time, but again, it just gives you an idea actually of what it looks like potentially uh, closer to reality, or actually this is what occurred from 1990 to 2011. So it's that variability of those years up and down in value rather than just looking at that rather perfectly smooth uh, variable variation that probably would much rather have. I hope you found that interesting. Let me know in the comments below if there's any scenarios that you'd like me to consider or, or, or look at, or let me know your thoughts on how you're going to take your income out from the various pots you have when you come to retire, or how best you managed your position when you did start drawing an income from the various pots you have available to you. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.